Welcome everyone to worship coming to you from Concordia Lutheran Church here in Conover. I'm Pastor Michael Gemmel and I would just um, pray God's blessings upon us as we worship him this day. Question, what shall we do? Reasonable, legitimate question to be asked in our current situation. But to whom should we direct this question? And is it even the right question in the first place? In the first reading for today from Acts chapter 2, the people heard a sermon delivered by Peter on the day of Pentecost, and when they heard it, they asked, what shall we do? The gospel reading is about the two men who were walking to Emmaus. While they were talking about the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, Jesus came to them. They were kept from recognizing Jesus, and after much discussion, which included Jesus recalling for the two what Moses and all the prophets had said about the promised Messiah. Night was coming, so they invited Jesus to stay. After breaking bread and giving it to them, Jesus vanished from their sight, which prompted another question, what we might call a burning question. They asked, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened the scriptures to us. Dear friends, there is an answer to all the questions that we have burning within us. What shall we do? Let us be prepared for the answer the Lord desires for us this day. <laughs>
begin our time of worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. Alleluia. Alleluia. We pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. is from Acts chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort him, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received the word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from the first um, chapter of Peter. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, 
but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. from the 24th chapter of St. Luke, verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priest and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here ends the gospel lesson. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. The text for the message on this third Sunday of Easter comes from not only the gospel lesson, but also the first reading 
from the second chapter of Acts. It's kind of an unusual text for the third Sunday of Easter because this is the day of Pentecost. Peter's sermon, standing up with the eleven. And Peter gives his sermon, and the response is, Brothers, what shall we do? How many times that question has been asked over the past month or so? Being asked in a lot of different scenarios. For example, it's asked of our political leaders. What shall we do to best cooperate with the orders that we're hearing? We're asking it of our medical leaders. What do we do to keep from being infected or from infecting others? We hear it from our law and enforcement leaders when we ask them, what shall we do to make sure that the local laws are and restrictions are being obeyed? And you know, we even ask that in our closest circles. What shall we do in this time of solitude and seclusion? What shall we do to have those relationships being nurtured when we're sometimes so close together that we need our space. What shall we do? Thankfully, a lot of people are answering that question by spending quality time with their spouses, with their children, having a time to come together and to even enjoy and to laugh together. Now children, I imagine, not being in school, are asking a little different form of that question, what shall we do, usually phrasing it like, I'm bored, there's nothing to do. But what do we do when we're bored? Well, I don't know if you can see it, but these faint whiskers on my chin speak to my boredom. I hate it. My wife has yet to comment. But I was bored. What do we do? Not to make too light of it, because there is a very serious aspect of that question. A New York Times piece reports that movement restrictions aimed to stop the spread of the virus may in fact be making violence in homes more frequent, more severe, and more dangerous. Dear friends, we need to be aware of that. And we need to be in prayer for these families, for those people who are facing escalating violence, abuse, and have very limited means to escape their current situations. We also need to be in prayer for those who, because of this isolation, are increasing levels of depression and anxiety. It's a difficult time for a lot of people. And the church needs to be in prayer Now the challenge, one of the challenges for the church, for the people of God, because it's so easy to take that question, what shall we do, and turn it around and ask, not what shall we do, but who do we blame? Where do we affix blame, this virus that has come upon the world? What finger can we point in accusation? to somehow in our own minds make sense of what we're experiencing. But you see, the blame game serves no real purpose. It's been going on far too long. We can trace it back, certainly, even to the Garden of Eden. As Eve blames the serpent or Satan, Adam blames Eve, Adam blames God. When we try to affix blame, we need to understand that we're simply carrying on the patterns of human behavior that come as a result of sin and a rejection of God. Nothing bad comes from a good and loving God, and nothing good comes from sin that flows through mankind. It is mankind's rejection of God that has resulted in all manner of unpleasant and sometimes just tragic consequences. But hear this very well. God is not to blame for the situation we find ourselves in today. 
Nor is he to be blamed for any disease or war or injustice or violent outbreak. That's not who our God is. The fact is, and you know this all so well, we live in a fallen, crooked world. In Peter's sermon, he says that very thing in Acts 2, verse 40. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Some of you may be familiar with the poem about the crooked man. That there was a crooked man, he had a crooked smile, he had a crooked sixpence and he walked a crooked mile. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse and they all lived together in a crooked little house. Strange place to put a nursery rhyme, I agree. But stay tuned because the question, what shall we do? That which is so asked of our political and medical and law enforcement leaders and that question, yes, we ask of ourselves, is the question asked to the apostles after the message. And after the message, there was no doubt who was to blame. In the beginning of Acts 2, if we were to go backwards in the text, we read about the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Then Peter stands with the eleven, delivers his Pentecost sermon, reminding the people that what they saw was indeed a fulfillment of prophecy. He tells them this is all in the plan of God to send Jesus, this one who performed powerful works, signs, wonders, by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, this Jesus, Peter was saying, is delivered into the hands of lawless men, put to death by crucifixion. And twice, please take note, twice in Peter's message, he places blame precisely where it needs to be, and that is squarely on the shoulders of those who are truly guilty. And who is that? Verse 23 of Acts 2, this Jesus you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And then in verse 36, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Those words cut to the heart of those who heard. And the cry went up from them, not who's to blame, because they knew. The cry went up, what shall we do? They were caught, as we are, when we hear that it was sin, our sin, the sin of this crooked world that put Jesus on the cross. We are all in the crosshairs of the law, condemned sinners, no innocent bystanders of the crucifixion, Guilty of murder, murder of the sinless Son of God. So what shall we do? We have options. When we are confronted with our guilt, with a harsh reality that it was indeed our sin that sent Jesus to the cross, we have options. We can ignore it. Hope it goes away. Live as if Jesus never was. We can take in the law and then point the finger elsewhere and blame others. That's an option. We can receive the law, feel its conviction, and make excuses for it. These are all common responses to the conviction of our own sins. But for the child of God, for the one who truly hears and believes, there is only one option, and that is repent. To turn. To turn and to find the only solution. 
that it is in the cross of Jesus Christ that the crookedness of our sin is straightened out. Because that crookedness, as we continue on, it is a, is a stumbling, rocky, hazardous, dangerous place. It is a path that leads to destruction. Because we have a crooked house. And all things made crooked by sin cannot be made right in our own doing. The crookedness has a consequence. Did a little research on the poem. Supposedly, there is an urban legend associated with the poem, The Crooked Man, that says, if you recite the poem out loud, it will summon a demonic force known as the crooked man. And as you recite the poem, everyone in the house is cursed. Now, if you are a young child listening, that's not true. It's a lie. But we need to understand that there is a curse associated with the crookedness of sin. It is a curse that leads away from God because we have crooked houses, we have crooked neighborhoods, we have crooked cities, we have a crooked world. And it is that crookedness that is only straightened out as the love of God comes to us in Christ Jesus. The curse is broken. It is broken in the cross and the empty tomb. We live in the aftermath of that empty tomb. And we hear now the word of God, and like the two on the road with Jesus, our hearts burn within us because we've heard the truth. And that love now comes and flows from us, hearts that have been purified, covered in baptismal forgiveness, so that we can now walk that straight path, the one that leads to righteousness, the one that leads to heaven, the one that leads others to that same path. So dear friends in Christ, what shall we do? A daily repentance? A daily straightening by the Spirit's presence to remember our baptism and to live and to love in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Amen.
At this time, I invite you to join in a confession of our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of the church. The response to our petitions this morning is, hear our prayer. We pray. For the whole church, that the message of salvation joyfully be told throughout all the world, and the Easter victory of Jesus Christ be celebrated around the globe, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world, that the governments of all nations be a source of blessing to those who are governed, and that oppression in all forms be hindered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves in this season of our Lord's great victory, that we truly be Easter people all year long, radiating the light of Christ in our homes, workplaces, and communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who serve us through their callings, especially for those who deal with special challenges or dangers on a regular basis, including police, fire, and emergency personnel. Also, we remember at this time the military forces of our nation, those stationed both at home and abroad, whose efforts serve to defend our nation in challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those with special concerns and needs this day, those who are hospitalized, those who grieve, the unemployed and underemployed, the addicted, the chronically ill and shut in, and all others whose needs are known to us at this time. Bless them with your presence, gracious Father, that they have a sense of victory in their lives and find strength and hope for each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we bless you for having placed into our lives faithful Christian people to guide us. On this day, we remember those no longer among us on earth who have completed their earthly races and have won the final victory in Christ. Lead us to follow in their way, that we rejoice together eternally at your table and in your mansions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.